I'm Sean. I'm Brad. My first watch. My rewatch. The Wire, season two, episode four, Hard Cases. Hard Cases. Which sounds like a, I don't know, like I think it was Old Cases in season one. It sounds like a, yeah. like a very wiry title. Yeah. You're thinking it's something Prez Belusky wants or something. Like, yeah, I want a hard case. Or yes. Like we start off right away with Frank down at the harbor. He looks like he's pondering. Nick comes right up there complaining about having to wake up early in the morning to come see him. Doesn't know what this is all about. So he's obviously been summoned by Frank. Yeah. He's got like a cold in his eyes. Still, he's, yeah, he's tired. And this is about the missing cameras. We were wondering last episode, what exactly was going on with this can and Nick just kind of picking it up. And it was very confusing. Like, is he working? Is he a driver? They just taking these cans. How did he know they were in there? They skipped the entire scheme, the scam. And we get a little more, we get a little bit more of an answer here. They stole these cameras straight up from a customer. Yep. And Frank goes into a lot of detail about how like, you know, they can't afford to do stuff like this. They run a tight ship. They can't do stuff like this. So, the, yeah. The business is dying. And having someone say, oh, my product is missing. You guys took it. I'm going to go to another port and get my stuff docked there where I can trust that it's not going to be stolen. And he says, you know, they trust that, that their stuff's not going to end up missing. And he knows that, that Nick took these cameras. Yeah, and Nick says they're they're already sold now. Is he telling the truth here or what? He does. He does. He admits it. Um, but there's nothing. There's nothing that I mean. Frank knows. He doesn't. He doesn't ask them. He just straight up accuses them. And he says that the cameras have to come back. He doesn't even ask for like a confession from Nick. But he says the cameras come back because if the cameras don't come back, they are going to lose that business straight up. Right. That's a blow. That's a blow the union can't take. Right, right. So things are not looking good for, like, he cost them a lot. What Nick does cop to is that Ziggy is involved also. And the money was split three ways. Nick, Nick says he can't bring the cameras back because he already sold them. He doesn't say who he's, going, who he's sold them to. I think he says the Greeks, but he doesn't say who his third partner is. He tells him, I split the money between me and Ziggy. And he says, who's the third guy? And so Nick says, well, fuck, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, so, um, but we can reasonably assume that Nick knows, right? That Frank knows? No, sorry, that Frank knows who he sold it to, right? Yeah, the Greeks. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure he knows. He seems to be in the know about the whole situation, so. Yeah, and that's, and that's who, that's the only person that they have, like, really connecting with the cans and all that anyway. Right, right, right. We get our credits and our quote, if I hear the music, I'm going to dance, and that's from Greg's. Yes. That's when Kima. Uh, if I had known that was Kima in the beginning, I would have popped for it harder in the beginning. Oh, because he called her Greg's. Yeah, I'm used to her being referred to as Kima. So when it said Greg's, it, uh, it didn't just automatically register to me that's what, that it would be her coming up. So yeah, it's funny. McNulty's McNulty and, and Bunk is Bunk. Well, Bunk is his first name, though, actually, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. The Bunk. bunk. Yeah. 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 So. Well, we're going to start off with right where we kind of left off last episode with the COs and the hot shots where people were falling out the tainted drugs. The head CO says that this case is going to get made by an informant, a CI, <laughs> just like in the detail. So he tells them, I assume this is like the warden or the state's attorney that, you know, you're going to have to shave some years. If you're ready to shave some years off of people's sentences, that's how you get somebody to snitch in the prison. Right. Their main concern is finding out who brought the drugs in. Yeah, and we just see this is all a part of Avon's master plan. It's all kind of like unfolding the way he said it would. So, McNulty passes Rawls on the way into homicide. They kind of have like a what's him? He a captain or what? What is he? Major like Colonel? Uh, Colonel, sorry. Colonel. Uh, now, I'm sorry. Just the way that like Rawls looked back and like couldn't believe that this guy was in his office. Meanwhile, we as a viewer know McNulty's in and out of there all the time. It's just, and I said it last week, and I'm like, what if Rawls was there while he's here eating crab? Like, so McNulty now is going into homicide to check out this, this floater case. He's kind of taking the responsibility of the individual floater. Yeah. Rather than, than, than the 13 other girls and 
Bunk and Freeman are sticking with the 13 girls. But he's taking this floater. He said last episode he was going to give this one a name, and he has this, this picture of her. So he's taking this one very personal. He's there to, to get some information on the girl and go down to evidence. And when he encounters Bunk and Freeman, he kind of rags on them about the names on the board, and they're still pissed about it. Right. And he wants the evidence. He wants the, the evidence slip so that he can check out the evidence. That's not the right name of it, though. <laughs> Submission form. Submission form. So that, he can, so that he can check out the evidence. Bunk withholds it for a second because he says, listen, I want Omar. McNulty still hasn't given him a straight answer on Omar. And he says, I want Omar. And this is where McNulty says, I never lost him. Now, what is your opinion on McNulty in that scene? Because I thought it was very interesting. Look, okay, let me not say interesting. It was charismatic the way he came in. And he played, uh, I forget her name, um, Sergeant from the Docks first, BD. Yes, he plays BD first. Then he plays a little bit to Freeman because he knows Freeman wouldn't be where he is without McNulty at the end of the day. Without McNulty's detail last season, Freeman would still be stuck in the pawn shop unit. So he has a soft spot for him. He knows he's a good cop. So you could try to cause a plays to him a little bit and Bunk slows it down. So I just like that dynamic between him and all of them and him playing them all. And like you said at the end, him leaving with like, I never lost Omar. It's just a little charisma out of him when he's usually annoying me. So. And even them asking afterwards, he's like, he, he's got Omar? <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Yeah, he did say that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that was good. Burrell is meeting with Daniels. This is the moment you've been waiting for. You've been waiting for Burrell to have to take back his words a little bit and give some credit to Daniels after throwing him down in the basement. And he's kind of, I don't know, he's trying to start anew, I guess, with Daniels. But you can't really trust Burrell. Yeah, I thought Daniels really handled himself really well in that scene. Like, he didn't trust Burrell at all. And then he waited and got all the information he needed and deduced by the end of that conversation that, you know, Valchick asked for him by name. That's the only reason why he's in the room right now. So it was brilliant and it was just great. You can tell Daniels knows how to play the game, you know, even though he took an L season wise, Brian gets stuck in the basement. He knows how to play the game. You know, what Daniels wanted all along was to get out of the basement. He never wanted to be in the basement in the first place. He wanted just to do police work. And here he's being given this opportunity, but rather than just taking it, he starts asking questions and he plays hard to get. He tells him, my papers are in. And Burrell has to keep pushing and pushing. And the more he mentions, you know, the more he, he gives up, really. He, he says, oh, why don't you stick around? There's, there's going to be another position opening up. You know, you, you can leave the, leave the force for a few, after a few years on a major's pension. Now he's, now he's getting a raise and a promotion. And he tells him, if you do this, you know, I don't even care what happens. I don't even care if you make the case. Just as long as Valchek feels like he got his money's worth. And that's when it clicks to Daniels. Oh. That's what this is about. Valchek asked for me by name, didn't he? That's what he says straight up to Burrell. And realizes that there's a lot on the line here for Burrell. Yeah, so it's really brilliant. And one other thing about the scene that I thought was just really good is that Daniels not only figures out how to leverage Burrell, but for me, I, we got to just make this a milestone because this is my first actual spoiler. Something has been spoiled for me that we've embarked upon. Daniels asked Burrell for his own unit, his own major unit, and that was a spoiler that someone told me about that Daniels leads his own unit down the future. So the minute he said that, I'm like, Daniels is going to get that damn unit because I knew that, so... So he tells once once that happens, he says like I want a I want a permanent unit, and I get to choose my own people. Fuck me once, shame on you. Fuck me twice. Burrell has no choice but to agree. Right. So I thought that was really good, and you know Daniels, man, he he won the scene over for me. That this is the might be the W of the episode. Let's keep going though. Well, this is actually the note that you wanted me to make to you about how Daniels walks. Yes, he has a very specific like little like. I don't know, man. It's not George Jefferson because it's like his bottom half more than his top half. But he just, he, I don't know, man. He's got a lazy leg or something. We got to do a compilation video of Daniels walking out or in and out of rooms. It's very military. Okay. I feel, like, that, but... I feel like he's very, you know, rights and lefts. And Daniels is jacked also. That's, okay. that's another thing to know. Yeah, he's jacked. 
I had no idea. Okay. We'll see later on. Once it becomes a sex symbol in the show, we'll we'll see that. Okay, I, I see. <laughs> D'Angelo. Now we're going to him in jail, and the dealer, the guy that was like kind of passing around the the drugs in prison, is talking to D'Angelo about how the people that got hit, the people that were falling out, were lightweights. They're really thinking about, or at least this guy and probably the rest of the prison population is looking at this as some sort of attack on people or a get back revenge plan because why else would you do this in jail but the more d'angelo's hearing it i think the way that the conversation goes later on we understand what he's thinking as he's hearing what happened here what do you think d'angelo's thinking because the way i interpret it and uh you go into the details of the scene but d'angelo kind of confronts avon and tells him whatever you're doing i want no parts of it he doesn't want any of the reduced sentence that may come of this situation so um, I don't know if he's fully aware or even smart enough to know the depth of what Avon's planning, but he just knows he doesn't want to be involved. Yeah, I don't think he knows about – I don't think he's necessarily putting together the reduced sentence deal that, that Levy's going to end up making at the end of this episode. I think what he's hearing when, when this guy's talking about, you know, whoever loaded up the drugs didn't know what they were doing. It was more rat poison than dope. I think D'Angelo's hearing that and how ruthless of an attack and how uncaring of who got hurt this was. And he's thinking, my uncle did this. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I can agree with that for sure. And he, and he's ashamed of him. He doesn't want to be involved with it. So now, how do you feel about that? Cause I mean, I hate to be that guy, man, but Avon is just doing what he got to do. And D'Angelo, you know, you're part of the family, whether you want to or not, you're taking the time for them. So if, if there's an opportunity for you to get a reduced sentence, why would you say I want no parts? Is it just because morally he thinks to himself, that could be me if I didn't listen to you? Is, do you think that's what it is? No, I, I think I think D'Angelo just quite simply isn't made out for the game, wants no part of the game, is just in the game because his family is in the game and he had no other choice at a young age. I don't think this is him. Much like, you know, much like he was trying to tell Wallace, you know, get out, go back to school. This is not D'Angelo's path and any dip back into that, he does not want to be in there. I don't know if you remember in season one when he was talking to McNulty and Daniels in the interrogation, the final interrogation. And he said, I was courtside for eight months and I was more freer in jail than I was home. Yeah, I remember that. He, uh, he, like you said, he's not built for it. I remember he that. Can't, he says he can't breathe. That's what he kept saying. I want to just breathe like normal folk. Yeah. He can't. The, the, the criminal life is not his. And I think he, I think when he starts seeing, first of all, the fact that he knows Avon set this up and the fact that Avon told him that some things are coming down, I think he's thinking, oh, no. He, like, he can see it. Right? He's, he, and, and I think, to his credit, it's showing strength. Is for the it? Per, for the first time. What kind of strength? Because I think so many times criminals, we hear about criminals, not all criminals, but a lot of times criminals, especially in TV or whatever, they do crooked stuff, they go to jail, they do other crooked things, and they never really learn their lesson. So D'Angelo, just to play it out, D'Angelo goes along with this and he gives them a name. Now he's out with, with Avon, as Avon says that they're going to be sharing years. When he gets out in, I don't know, he had 20, maybe he's only going to do some, say maybe he only gets six, I don't know. Right. Then what? Does he, go home and, does he go home to Baltimore and just do his own thing? No, now he's, he's indebted. You don't just come home. Now you're you're out to keep doing the, running the business. Okay, um, that that's true. I just think a smart guy, which D'Angelo might not be, could use that as leverage. Like, hey man, I took this twenty for you. I fingered this ju- uh, this this cop for you that was selling drugs. Like, you owe me out the life or whatever, or you owe me. You know, he could use it as leverage if he was smart. I <clears> think. But I don't think he's gonna. Or like you said, I don't think he would. I think the time for Avon to owe him was to not make him take the charge in the first place. That's a good point. Remember, he was going he was going to go free. We're going back and forth with McNulty going through the floater's uh, luggage, I guess, finding some different things. 
we go to Ziggy now, who's playing with the stolen camera at the bar. I guess he took one for himself. Ziggy is annoying as hell. Ziggy's the worst. <laughs> Terrible criminal. Nick slips him uh, a nice wad of cash. Ziggy is very loud about it. Did you see the SD card? He's at, Nick can't figure out how a digital camera works. And again, this is like 2003 or something. You know, this is a big SD card. Right. This is not like what, what we use today. Uh, yeah. this, was, this was huge. And, and Nick just keeps going back to this. Like, you don't need to develop it or you don't, like, <laughs> he's, no, you put it on the computer. My, where we are today. Yeah, that was a cool little slice of 2000 and whatever. But Nick is, is basically there, one, to give him the cash and also tell Ziggy, don't spread cash around. That was Frank's word to, to Nick. And Nick was like, oh, of course, I know this. But, and also tell him, hey, by the way, your dad knows. And Ziggy freaks out. He's scared. He doesn't know what his dad's going to say. And Nick's like, oh, it was no big deal. Once I told him, he just gave up asking about it. And Ziggy's like, yeah, it's going to be very different for me. I can't believe Nick thought this was a good idea to begin with. He's not very bright from what I've seen so far. Like I kind of was hoping for him when he was, when he had to talk with his lady and he's like, all right, I got to make a plan. Like I was hoping I was rooting for him, but he's not like, did he really think this was going to be the plan? And it seems like later on, we'll see this is the plan of him just to use that money and go buy a house. But this is absolutely the plan. Yeah. He's, he's all in on this. Yeah. Ziggy then takes a picture of his dick. Jimmy's checking his voicemail. He's got a couple messages. His ex-wife, Elena, instructions on picking up the kids. Yep. Bunk, looking for Omar, Dennis, and Eileen Nathan, who is the state's attorney, also looking for Omar. Right, right, and leaving the voicemails. That's awesome. Oh, my God. Nick wakes up. Uh, I guess it's like 6 a.m. or 6.30 a.m. His girlfriend is in bed with him. His wake-up process is... I guess kind of loud because they sleep in a twin bed in the basement and the bathroom's right next to it. So his girlfriend's up. Nick's mom is pounding on the, on the floor. Like we saw a couple episodes ago, wanting him to get up and go to work and catch some hours. This is where we kind of find out like how undeveloped the living situation is for Nick and Amy. He tells his girlfriend is the mother of his child to, to go out the back door and he'll pick her up around there, around back. Yeah, it's pretty, like I said, this is not a great episode for Nick. It's like he's not showing himself to be an adult right now. So. It was a weird, I don't know, it was a really weird scene because to me it just said to the audience, she should leave him. Yeah, or that, yeah, I mean, essentially that he's not much of a provider or a stand-up guy, so. He what grabs her boobs. Like, it's just weird. I mean, it's a slice of their relationship and what, they like each other, I guess. BD explaining to Freeman and Bunk how the docks work. Yeah. And how the checkers make sure that cargo gets loaded and that the manifest is correct and that nothing comes in or out without getting checked in. So they deduct from that that they have to talk to a checker. But BD tells them nobody's going to talk to the police. And Bunk says, so then how do you make a case? And this is where we learn a little bit about BD's life that she's got two kids, she was a, a toll clerk, she collected tolls, and she was making 22.5, she says, and she passed the bulletin that said 33,000 with benefits to be Port Authority, so she took the job because her uh, boyfriend, father of her children, left and never came back, S stopped calling three years ago, yeah. and she's been all by herself, and she wasn't gonna make it with kids on 22.5, and Bunk says, did you even want to be a police? And BD just kind of shrugs. Yeah, I mean, I just got to say, that scene for me was just like, and The Wire is usually good for not doing this, but this scene was like exposition city for me. It was like, Bunk would say, hey, this gum tastes pretty good. And BD would be like, my husband had left me like gum and my two kids at home when I walked by that bulletin board. And so, you know, it was just, it was a lot of exposition on her. It didn't feel like a natural conversation. But I guess we need the context coming up. I don't know. I, I'm not sold on BD. I'm not. She's not a character for me right now that I'm that interested in. But um, the context of her relationship with the ports and how that works, I, I know that her knowledge is expert in that area. I think they're trying to help you understand more about her life so that you're invested in her. Yeah, they had to do a, a dump. 
Yeah, but it's, I, like needed. it's like here's BD's whole story in like the back of a seat conversation. Like you're not even in the front seat. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm just like, yo, I'm hearing your be- your whole story, your life story from the back seat of the car. It just what, felt, I don't know. What I took away the most of it though was that she didn't want to be a cop. That's true. That was a takeaway at the end. That's that true. was, you know, for me, I guess wasn't the way they did it. But at the end of the day, that what they got to the bottom of was that she took this job out of a, a necessity. And that's pretty scary for police. Yeah. Was then, is now. I wonder how many other police officers on the force are like this. You know, when we talk so much about the good police and people who wanted, who wanted to do this. Right. Bunk's almost saying, like, what the fuck is she doing here then? Yeah. Yeah, you could tell that's that's kind of his takeaway. It's like, damn, she's caught up in this murder case. You know? And she even says, you know, he asked originally about how do you make a case. She said she just patrols. Like, her job is very cyclical, pattern. She just drives around. If something's off, she writes a report. And that's it. There is no, like, investigative, hard detective tactics going on with this job. Exactly. Exactly. And until now. D'Angelo confronts Avon on the hot shots. He says, how'd you know? (laughs) And Avon says he didn't know about it. Right? This is kind of takes me back to season one. If we did, we had a reason. And if we didn't, we had a reason. But he might know who did do it. Right. I didn't know, but I might know who did. Right. And this is where Avon's just like stone cold about it. There's no emotion about what's happened. And I think that's what bothers D'Angelo. Yeah. You know, he, the gears have already been moving for Avon. He knows the play, but he's laying it out now for, for D'Angelo. And he says, it's not about what happened. It's about using it to our advantage. It's play or get played, he says. Right. And Avon denies it, denies having anything to do with it, and says that he can give D'Angelo the right name, and D'Angelo can take that name and get some years taken off of the set. Mm-hmm. And, and then, no parts. yeah, D'Angelo says, I don't want no part of what you got going on, Avon. And he says any more. Like he puts a, he kind of puts a period on it. He does. He doesn't want it like anything that he's doing, not just within this specific scheme, but period. McNulty goes to Omar's old burnt up van, tries the old tactic, puts his card on there and a couple kids, bunch of kids pass by and McNulty asks, Hey, any of you guys see Omar? And they all just stare at him like, but you can tell they know who Omar is from that reaction. Nick on the docks. Diggy is hanging around with a nice new coat. Leather jacket on the docks for some reason. Italian leather jacket. $2,000. He says he paid for it. And this is coming right off of Nick telling Ziggy, don't spend any money. Don't look flashy. Why? Why? Ziggy says uh, he's going to tell people that he, he's paying for this on installments. That doesn't make a difference. <laughs> oh, my God. Or whatever. He said installments or whatever. The Greeks want to talk to them because they did so well, so they're going to have another meeting. Yeah. McNulty's driving around looking for Omar, pulls up on a drug corner. All the guys right away turn around. They know the drill, hands on the wall. And McNulty says, no, no, we don't, we don't have to do that now. He says, but I hate littering. Pick that shit up when I go. Yeah. Yeah, all the guys dropped their shit when they saw McNulty. So he's just asking for Omar. And, of course, nobody's talking to him. No one's going to talk to a cop on the corner. They all walk away. So Stringer's in the trap house. This is weird, right? It's weird, but it's extenuating circumstances because the way they got from Atlanta is not what they're used to. So it's not as good. And, you know, and they got to keep up the demand. So Stringer makes a decision to step on it. And I mean, seeing this movie, uh, sorry, seeing the show after seeing movies like American Gangster, which um, Idris Elba was also in, it's just a different perspective of like when you step on stuff for greed and when you step on stuff for necessity. And right there, you could tell Stringer didn't want to, but he had to. So well, he's going to lose money on it because he said it's more expensive, even though it's it's worse quality from what they're getting in New York. Exactly. And so, so he says, "I'm going to lose my money." And, and that's when he says, step on it. And, and I don't know, I just thought w- with how careful everything is, this is our first time ever actually seeing, like, drugs. The closest we've seen to this is, is when Prez took the trash from the, from the main stash house. That's the closest we've, we've come to seeing, like, drugs like this. 
Yeah, I think they just kind of did it to illustrate the point that, like, this was a game time decision that, you know, this emergency. Wait, yeah, that Stringer was there to, like, make the decision. So, um, and they need the visual representation of the Coke behind them and them physically cutting it and all that stuff. But yeah, you're right. This is the first time we've seen him in in the vicinity of drugs like that. He's in New Avon, so he kind of has to now. Bunk and Freeman have to go to Rawls now and explain that they are nowhere and nothing worked. And this, he goes back to what we were saying and what you were saying, I think last episode, you guys fucked up when you let the boat go. They said, what were we supposed to do? We had no jurisdiction in Philadelphia. No one would talk to us. No one would even speak English. We had zero choice. And he goes, hey, I don't know what to tell you. Work it as you see fit. And that's, that's a, another great wire phrase, work it as you see fit. But if I got to throw a scapegoat or two to Burrell, you guys are, the, are it. How much space is on that boat with McNulty? Not much. Not for, not for all three of those guys. So. And the bunk don't swim. McNulty is still looking for Omar. He's driving around patrolling, and he sees, he sees our old pal, Bubbles. Bubbles and Johnny. He follows them on to going onto a bus with some scheme. Yeah, uh, they're, they've got trench coats on. It's very funny. Nick is talking to Triple G. So this is the meeting. It's not with the big guys, not with the Greek or, or with Spiros, but Triple G wants chemicals. I think sulfuric acid. Apparently they have these on the docks. Yeah, and it's interesting. The minute I hear this, I'm thinking they're like doing cooking crystal meth or something or getting the ingredients for it. McNulty catches Johnny and Bubbles. The whole scheme here is they're stealing like electronics and sticking them in their in their trench coat. Yep. So McNulty throws them in the car and says, You're gonna have to, you can keep it, but you're gonna have to pay tax on this. <laughs> and the tax is Omar. And it's funny how at this point now, the legend of Omar seems so much, I mean, we know Omar. Omar is a, is a dangerous guy, but we know him as witty and charismatic and funny. But they hear Omar and they are scared to death. And we kind of have to remind ourselves who Omar is by reputation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then you could tell that Johnny wants no parts of anything that has to do with it. So what do you think is motivating Bubs here? Because I'm just thinking it has to be for Kima, right? Does he feel bad? About that still, he still feel like, I don't know, because what's motivating him to actually, later on we see that he's, he leaves a Walkman for McNulty as like, kind of like a, here's your tax, right? Yeah, he's almost, dis- he's so disgusted, he doesn't even want to keep the, keep it anymore. But it's still also a bit of a peace offering, I think, right? I think McNulty's being serious here. You stole this shit, dude. You're in trouble. You can't steal. I'm a cop. I caught you. <laughs> I guess I meant Bub's like leaving it because remember McNulty was going to give it back? He's like, caught. He doesn't want it. It's no good if he gets caught. He doesn't want it back. Later on, McNulty gives that to his ex-wife. Levy and Avon meet with the CO to let's make a deal. They want support for probation from the prison after one year instead yeah. of, I think it was 28 months mm-hmm. that he was up for parole, instead they, which is two, two and four months. And so after, instead, after a year, they want support. And the CO brings up, isn't Avon in jail because like that the cop getting shot? Avon speaks up for himself and, you know, my name wasn't anywhere on that paperwork. I had no involvement in that. That wasn't me. That was just other stuff gone wrong. Again, look at the paperwork. I'm not involved in the cop getting shot. I'm so sorry for your friend. Yeah. Again, Avon playing chess. Nick comes home. His mom's making dinner and... The dad is at the bar. We haven't seen the dad yet. First time he's dad. Yeah, Louis Sabatka is his name. So Nick goes to, to go find him. He's playing the horses at the bar, Louis is, I guess just for fun. He says, I'm up 7,000. Nick says, you know, why don't you let me take you down to Pembago when it opens and, you know, play for real. And his dad doesn't seem very interested in that. Nick tells him about the work that, that they did today and, and the ship they unloaded and his dad's eyes light up and reminiscing about about a ship that that they worked on back in the day nick asks him he says uh do you ever miss it and his dad kind of looks up and and he says like what's the point or something but he his dad seems dead inside a little bit yeah or or he's disconnected from the world that nick's connected to at least like he's in his own uh existence right now and they just go to dinner tuna surprise tuna surprise <laughs> sounds awful but whatever Gross. 
Rawls gets Daniel's list. Again, Daniel's just telling people how it's going to be. Yeah, I love him asserting himself throughout this whole episode. Like I said, he might have won. Confirms we're getting we're getting the band back together. We're getting Freeman. We're getting we're getting Greg's. We're getting Herc and Prez. But but Raw says you need my approval for everybody, not just these guys. And because of that, you cannot have McNulty. McNulty drowns or quits. He says that's right. the only two ways off the boat. Right. So he's not giving up McNulty, and uh, but he says you know he's recognizes his loyalty. He, he says, you're a loyal guy. Rawls fills Daniels in. He's like, do you even know what this is about? And Daniels like, ah, oh, something with beef with, with this, with the ports or, and he says, you know, these guys are, these guys are just pissing on each other's legs. That this is a, a bullshit feud case. This is a go nowhere assignment. And asks me, says, oh, anything to get out of the basement, huh? And he kind of doesn't even respond to that. He just kind of leaves. But this is how the last case started, right? No one believed in Avon as a mastermind criminal. No one believed anything was going on. We already know now that that at least the docs are working with some pretty vicious killers. True. It's true. Kima and Cheryl, we get a little, little scene with these guys. Your favorite? They're in a traffic jam. I have no fucking clue what they were doing, where they were at, what was going on here. It was so random. I thought this was so out of place. I think it was a college game, it's implied. They were at some college game uh, around college kids who were being rowdy. They were leaving a college show. Well, there's some frat guy, and, and there's cars in front, and they're stuck behind this car, and Kim is getting upset, and Cheryl's saying, you got to think like a lawyer, stop thinking like a cop, and just nagging, nagging, nagging. Kima can't take it, probably more so because she can't stay in the car with Cheryl. She just had to get out and do something else. I don't know. I think this is no. I mean, I think this is an example of her uh, hearing the music, so she wants to go dance, right? So she sees a guy breaking the law. She's gonna go do something about it. Kima goes. This guy's like mooning, the, mooning everybody now at this point. He's got his pants down. So it looks like Kima almost jacks him out of the sunroof, out of the moonroof. I don't know, but jacks him up and arrests him right there on the street. And Cheryl is just so disappointed in her woman. Yeah, she's not feeling this at all. So. And I'm not feeling her. <laughs> Daniel's watching a documentary about dogs being obedient to masters and Marla. Everything Daniel's this episode, this is Daniel's best episode since I started watching the show. And this scene was perfect because there was no dialogue, but you see Daniel's watching the shit and he's thinking, and this is how I'm interpreting it. You stop me if I'm wrong, but he's watching these dogs learn how to be trained. And he's thinking to himself, is that what I am? Am I Burrell's trained dog or Valchek's trained dog or whoever's trained dog right now? And then his wife comes down, looks at the TV, looks at him and says, honey, just come to bed. Don't think about the shit. Let it go. Like, it's, they just had so much dialogue between each other without any dialogue. I love scenes like that. But what do you think? Well, I find it odd that his concern is wondering about the perception of his job and what his role is in the police department. But we know also his wife doesn't want him to do this. Well, take his wife out of the equation for a second, right? Because when you're at work, you're, when you're at work and you've got your clothes on and you're doing your job, like you're not necessarily thinking about your spouse. So for Daniels as a man, he's thinking to himself, and is what am I, what am I, what I'm doing? Is it have purpose or am I just a dog jumping through hoops? So am I being a cop? Because I have the skills to be a good cop. So am I using those skills? to be a good cop and doing good or am I just jumping through hoops for Burrell and Valchek? So I think that's what he's weighing, what's weighing on him. And then his wife coming down is just her being a comfort and like, whatever you're thinking about, don't worry about it, come to bed. Even if she doesn't know the depth of what's going on in his mind. So I mean, if he's thinking about it almost that literal, I think, man, he's, he's extremely naive about, about organ, organizations and military based group you know what i mean police what do you mean military i mean that is your job to follow orders that's why there's a that's True. why there's a hierarchy there is no you know open open desk plan in a police department where everyone is equals and the chief sets them, you know like if, if that's really what he's wondering then brother what did you sign up for 
Well, I think there's a difference between doing a detail for a legitimate drug drug uh, okay. you know, murderer and then doing a detail for a few between two Polacks, as uh, Rawls put it. You know what I mean? I think that's what it is. And it's like, I'm just a dog. One, I think one has value in his mind. Catching Avon has value to him. He was willing to go federal with it. And Frank Sabatka, he doesn't, they don't think they have anything. And we'll see later on uh, when Kima and Prezin the meet up, if that uh, they all kind of agree we don't have much. So. so that's a great point. You know, watching this originally and watching it every time, I watch it knowing, of course, the season's going to go on. We've already seen stuff happening with the Sabatkas on the docks. So obviously there's going to be something going on. So I, I don't think I've ever sat with the idea that maybe this isn't worth it. Maybe this case that Daniels is being sent on has zero value at all. And he's just, he's completely being, while he's being used as a pawn, I look at it as an opportunity for him to further his career. Obviously this show has multiple seasons. So, you know, I think. Even with the spoiler, I know that he gets his own unit. I don't want to know anymore, but you having the context of the rest of the show, you're like, yeah, man, what's he sitting there thinking about watching the TV? This is a great opportunity for him. But me sitting with the episode and the information they're giving me, uh, uh, Rawls in the office saying, he's going to get it out of the basement. You know what I mean? Like Burrell having to beat him over the head to get him to come back to do it. They're positioning this job as something, as a case, as something you wouldn't want. So that's why I understand why he's there watching TV. Like, Am I just some dog jumping through hoops doing this job or is this valuable? You know, I'm about to be a lawyer. I have the skill to be a lawyer. Do I need this job? So yeah, you're, what you said is correct. Exactly. That's great perspective though. I think it's just, you know, you having the rest of the knowledge is what gives you, you know. No, no, for you. I mean, that's great perspective to be able to look at it like that in the fact oh. to be able to look at it on, on, you know, in his eyes that he doesn't know and that this really might be worthless. Right, right. He's giving up. He's giving up a fruitful law career, law career to possibly get jerked around for another bunch of years again. When he was out, right. He signed the papers. Right, right. signed. Yep. Mm-hmm. Ziggy asked about the chemicals to that guy John, who was the third guy involved, right? And yeah. John tells them that there's another doc that has them, and they have a maybe a hookup that Ziggy could go and ask. Ziggy's okay. wearing the the jacket, and there's like this bully. Mally is his name, and this guy bumps into into Ziggy with his chair and spills coffee all over Ziggy's new coat. It basically like puts it out there that everyone knows that Ziggy got the money from stealing shit. Yeah, he's like just steal another one. Yeah. Daniels comes to Kima. We kind of catch it halfway through the through the conversation, and and Kima tells Daniels she can't come back to the details. She made a promise to Cheryl. So Daniels has already gotten the approval but hasn't actually talked to Kima about it yet. Now, let me ask you this. You think if McNulty didn't have the little conversation with him about her not being a house cat, you think Daniels would have been as confident to get the approval before even talking to Kima? What do you mean? Well, remember when McNulty comes down to the basement and talks to Daniels when they're in the evidence room, sure. and he's like, how's Kima doing? Daniels makes the comment that you know she's in uh, forfeitures or whatever. Um, and McNulty responds right away, like, house cat, that ain't her. And right. Daniels kind of, like, registers that. And I think, I, I may be adding things because I like Daniel so much in this episode, but I feel like that registers with him, and he knows, I don't need to go to Kima right away. Let me get the approval first, because I know when I go to her, she's going to say yes, because she's not a house cat, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. I, I mean, I guess so. I mean, he knows Kima, you know? Yeah. He knows Kima because that's his, his girl anyway, like under him by when I say his girl, I'm not trying to. Uh, use yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He he helped he helped bring her up. She, she was in his department. Right. In his department. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess. Maybe- I was just reminded of that conversation when because I thought the same thing you said. I'm like, you didn't even ask Kima yet. But then like in the back of my head, I'm like, you know what? He knows Kima and McNulty confirmed that in his head for him. So I feel like he didn't even need to. He knew that she would come around. And he may not even know why. He may not know exactly that, like, she made a promise. He might think she's scared. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. he might just think that she's out of position and she just needs the right case to bring her back. Right, 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 right. But Dan, this is where we find out, for sure, Daniels tells Kima, shit, you don't know Marla. Marla's not happy about this. His own wife. And so they're both going to go into this knowing that it could be detrimental to their relationships. 
Well, there's two key takeaways for uh, for me from the scene. It's Daniel's goals. You tell mine, if I, and I'll tell you yours. I'll tell my wife if you tell yours, yeah. Yeah, and then they kind of play with that in the shots later. So I love that. Um, but the other thing is that Daniels gives her a chance to, you know, she's like, you can be in house, like you mentioned her being scared potentially. He says to her, you know, you can be in house like Prez was, you know, we don't got to have you in the field. And she says, in the title of the episode, if I hear music, I'm going to dance. Yeah. So she's going to go as far as she has to for whatever this may entail. That lets me know that's going to get exciting as we go along. So. Now we get to cut into the office again, the funeral parlor office where Stringer set up and Shamrock comes in and Stringer hands him like a pack of halls and tells him to be subtle. And he says, you know what subtle means? And Shamrock says, yeah, I'll lay back and shit. Something like <laughs> and we know the halls are what Officer Tillman used to bring the drugs into the prison. Johnny and Bubs are getting high in a drug house and they're being pretty like careless and loud about looking for Omar. And I don't know. I thought this was a little convenient the way this whole thing was playing out. Well, just Omar's um, one of his girls being there. Is that what was convenient about it? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So one of the stick up girls is, is getting information from another fiend in the house in like another room and just happens to hear Bubs asking about Omar. One of the old guys that's in there that Bubs is asking, he tells us, shit, you want to, you want to find Omar, you need to stand out in the corner with a big package, and you'll see him soon enough. Levy tells the COs that the drugs can be found on CO Tillman's person, locker, car, if you do a search, and that's the only way that they're really going to be able to honor this deal that Avon wants to do. Right. The Department of Corrections gives in. Sure, fair deal. One year probation, in a year we give you the probation if we can find something. But if not, deal's off. And Levy and, and Avon are like, oh, you're going to find something. <laughs> so the CO says, the head CO, I feel like he represents the good police in the department there. Yeah. He says, you know, 10 to 1, that's the motherfucker that spiked those drugs. Right. But they don't even care. The state's attorney says, we make the case that's there to make. So do you have any evidence of that? Which they don't. So very similar to in Baltimore police department with Rawls and Burrell and those, whatever's there, you just make a case and keep it moving. doesn't matter about the facts. It's about the stats. Now, can I ask a question? How do you think Avon communicated this plan to Stringer? Yeah. How do you think, I think he Levy did? Yeah. I think Levy did, yeah. The plan of the hot shots, I mean, of you're going to take this guy where his where he's getting his supply from. Is that they, I know they had the conversation in the yard. Um but I don't know if they went into this much detail. So that's why I'm curious. How do you think he knew or is it just all kind of piecing together that way? No, it's a good question. I think maybe there's some I think showing that Stringer was in the fenced area for visitation hearing how openly they were talking about the Atlanta Connect to get the re-up on the phones, I think maybe is showing that Avon has some sort of leniency with communication. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. Okay. Valchek gets a new picture of the surveillance van from the Union. It's been in New Orleans. Oh, my God. It's been everywhere. It's, it's going a world tour, man. <laughs> Then he gets a visit from Daniels, who comes in. This is the Southeast District. And, boy, Valchek is fucking pumped. Valchek does bring up the good turn that Daniels did for Presbaluski last, last season. So I think he almost thinks, like, rescuing Daniels out of the basement is his repayment of that. Yes, he does. He thinks the favor is paid now. Valchek tells Daniels about the target and the port and – then he wants to show them their new place. Pretty good digs, he says. He's very pumped up for this. I mean, I guess it is good compared to the last set, the last digs, right? Yes. McNulty is still on, is, is now on the hunt. He's doing two hunts, one for Omar and one to figure out what's up with this floater. So Does he have a day job? Like, what, isn't he, like, supposed to be at his – that's what I was thinking the whole episode. Like, why isn't he on the boat? Yeah. yeah. Why isn't he on the boat? He's at a church. Something like that. And he's talking to this lady who's cooking for the priest. 
and asks her to read this letter that he found in evidence. And this is from a young woman to maybe like to an older woman or to a mother, but it's written to the whole family. So there's no names, but we do know that now the girl's name is Nadia. Yes. So he has a name for his floater now. Boy, I, this felt so D'Angelo. Nick is walking with his girlfriend and their daughter, and he says, you know, I've, I've come into some money. Just surprise, a few thousand dollars I just got from this Christmas fund of delayed work, and, and I'm thinking we need to get a place. And she's like, really? And he, like, takes it further. He's like, yeah, except, you know, like, we, sh- we shouldn't be renting. We should buy. And he's, like, offering the, the dream life to his girlfriend. Right, off of one score, so. And his daughter knows the ships. So you see it's passed down from generation to generation. That was actually cute, yeah, that's, that's cool. The COs approach Tillman in the parking lot and tell him that we need to search the car, and he's like, fuck that. And I guess the rules are like, you've driven, it feels like school when they would do searches and for your locker and, and your car at school when people get in trouble. But you drove the car onto the onto property of the jail. It's now within the jail's rights to search it. So they search it and very subtle and shit, just like he was told, <laughs> laid back and shit. It's somewhere in the, down the ground or something, under something, and they find the halls pack. And Tillman right away says this is bullshit, it's planted, and they find the drugs. And they arrest Tillman right then and there. So, you know, now Avon's plan is unfolding. And, and the first thing I thought is, what happens to Tillman if he gets put in jail for selling drugs in jail? Like, you know, especially after the way he's been treating Weebay. So uh, how scary, right? Yeah. Ziggy's fucking with that bully's computer, Maui, putting his picture that he took of his dick, putting that on the guy's computer. Yeah. That was pretty, uh, that was pretty obvious, right? That was what he was trying to do. Yeah. Beatty and Freeman and Bunk are back at the docks. Everyone's kind of whistling, letting people know that the cops are in town. Yeah, does this remind you of when they're in the pit and they yell, 5 5 Is the whistling kind of the docs equivalent of that for you? Yes. And they just want to see what kind of flex. Remember when, when they eventually, when Bunk and, and McNulty arrested D'Angelo in the pit, when that happened, everyone was watching. And Daniel said, what's the charge? He said, nothing. We just want to see what kind of flex he showed. And that's when they got him to write the note. So this is what they're trying with Horseface, the exact same ploy says he doesn't know anything about the dead girls and he's not going to talk to them and so he said come on let's let's go down to the to the precinct he says no and they go what he goes no and he says if if you got to go i need my union rep and and my lawyer and we're all going down he's not going to be pushed around he's not going to be cuffed he's not going anywhere and everyone's staring and bunk is like insulted he's pissed yeah he says so, like, pretty smart for a fat man or something like that. Yeah, exactly what he said. <laughs> While this is going on, Frank runs into Ziggy for the first time since the camera scam and slaps him upside the head. Right. That, does, that seems to be as bad as it's going to get. I know. That's, that's the sad part. He's, but you can tell he gets, gets a little privilege being a sabaka. Mally he sees Ziggy's dick on the computer. He's mad. Valchek says that the old detail is dead. Says they're all dead. <laughs> dead to me, at least. Yeah. Prez is there waiting for him. <laughs> He's so happy to see the band back together. Lester, we get the details that Lester is on his way tomorrow, but they get no McNulty officially. Herc brings up Carver, and Carver is in Valchek's district in the southeast, which we know because he's been papering the docks cars at Valchek's orders. But Daniels does not say anything when Herc brings up Carver. They didn't leave on good terms. No. Carver can't be trusted. So. Can't be trusted. And they're just going to give this thing a shot. That's, that's the plan. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. But they got a permanent detail. So let's make the best of it. A permanent detail? Oh, because this, this is his new unit now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Got they can it. bring in a case. Oh, uh, okay. Cool. Bubbles and Johnny are walking around. It's dark and it's perfect. Because Omar comes out of the shadows, and he calls him snitching bubbles. I was surprised, but I knew Omar was coming the minute it was a dark night scene after last we saw. So It's good that at least he knows that they have mutual friends and, and bubbles isn't a threat. I'm glad they didn't go some, some stupid route where Omar 
feels threatened by Bubbles or doesn't know Bubbles. There's no real reason for Bubbles to be afraid of Omar. Even though he puts a shotgun to his face. Yeah, that's just his style. <laughs> Cheryl is mad at dinner. This is the scene that we get. I love it. Just the cuts back and forth. I love when they do this. Game of Thrones did something similar when Tyrion was telling the story to all three people about giving up uh, Princess Marcella. It just reminded me of that for whatever reason. I thought this is another one of those film school style shots of, hey, let's just try it. And the camera's just going around and we see the uncomfortableness. And- well, there's stages to it. It's like frustration, annoyance, anger, and then they both get up and leave. <laughs> like, I just love it. I mean, I, I love it because I can sympathize. So. McNulty is at Elena's house. Things seem calmer than they were before. Remember last time he wanted to tuck the kids in and she wouldn't let him in the house. And this time they're doing the dishes and she's listening to the <laughs> to Bubbles headset. Yes. The walk. Well, I guess it's a CD man at that point, right? Disc man. Yeah. Yeah. Disc, disc man. And Elena asks about the separation papers. McNulty says that his lawyers told him not to sign it. He's giving way too much. He would never have to pay that much money in court. And yeah. Elena is pretty dejected. But McNulty pulls the letters out and says, I signed them anyway. And now she's happy. He says he doesn't want to argue about the money. He wants to get back together. Right. We so think- he says, like, you know, maybe that, I don't know. We'll see how she, how she takes to that. But that's him shooting the shot. Shamrock comes into Stringer's office. I was subtle with that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I miss Bodie, by the way. I, we saw Bodie episode one, and that was it. Yeah, it's been like four episodes. Bring Bodie back, man. But I thought this was interesting because he turns on the news to see the report about the CO being arrested with drugs in the car. And then after a couple seconds, Stringer turns it off and he says, I got, I got to study for a midterm. And Shamrock leaves. And I don't know. I thought it was an interesting reaction shot from Stringer. He didn't look happy. Well, I think um, he know, or I could be reading too much into it. So you stop me if I am. But I think he knows this is kind of Avon's plan in motion. And this equals Avon coming back out, which equals him having less influence over the organization. So String is basically saying, man, I got to examine the study for literally because once Avon comes back, I'm not going to be in charge of this shit anymore. And I got to focus on whatever my next thing is. So mm-hmm. that's how I think it. Bunk, Beatty, and Freeman go to the union bar. Now, this is the scene <laughs> that I love. Yeah. They just are going to fuck with these guys. Bunk goes up to Horseface at the jukebox and he says, you're not going to play that country shit, are you? I hate that country shit. <laughs> and he says, oh, I love this fucking line. He goes, not even Ray Charles could save it. <laughs> and Frank is at the bar and he's bullshitting with a guy and Freeman, Bunk and Beatty come walking up and he sees Beatty and he kind of friendly and then he sees Bunk and Freeman and now he's kind of worried this is like Frank's first time being interrogated in any type of way really yeah and he and he says like I that was an accident that was an accident he plays very innocent now before we get into the scene there's one little shot that I noticed and I want to know if you noticed it too they show Nick and he just looks so concerned like this doing of the cops coming may be his fault you know did you get that or You know, I took it way more personally. Okay. Like, he hates these guys fucking with his uncle. Oh, it could be that, too. Okay. See, I took it as guilt. Like, shit, man. Did I bring heat on us from from these cameras? I thought he looked... I thought he looked angry, and I thought he looked hateful. Okay. Now I'm curious, because maybe I misinterpreted that. I thought it was guilt. You know, maybe maybe it's just because there's been so much talk about when, when people say, you know, the joke about this show is always like, oh, season two with all the white guys. Why did they bring all the white guys in? And I feel like there's a very clear split, of course, between the two worlds of Stringer and Avon and everything that's happening there and the world of the ports. The two do not really seem to mix at all. Okay. And, and so when I see these these black detectives coming into... Now there's black guys in the in that in the union that hang out there. You've seen the the bald headed guy and the guy that was kind of like one of the one of the presidents of the union in the trailers. There's yeah, black guys uh, that Ziggy was uh, making black jokes about. Right? Yeah, right, right. They they slapped up earlier in the episode, and so there's black guys there. But 
I don't know. I feel like, you know, these two black guys walking in, it stands out. Mm. And so when I look at Nick looking at them, I just feel like it feels racial. He's already dropped the N bomb when, when asked about, you know, selling drugs. Yeah. No, that's fair. Maybe I need to rewatch it because I took it as him feeling guilty that, oh, maybe I made a bad choice stealing that crate because, look, I'm bringing heat of the cops to this place now because I don't even know if Nick is aware about the dead girls. Does he even know about the dead girls? Oh, like, everyone. I think everybody knows about the dead girls, but I don't think if he, know, he knows that it's still an ongoing issue, I guess. Well, that's what I was going to say is that I don't know if Frank knows that this is a murder investigation. Exactly. exactly. When he says that was an accident and they shake their head no and his face kind of drops like, what the fuck do you mean? I'm sure he, he, you know, I mean, Nick absolutely knows because he went with Frank to talk to to Spiros about what happened. Why didn't you tell us those girls were, were, there were girls in the can. So their whole thing is like, okay, they were shipping girls, but at no point are they thinking someone murdered them all. They think something accidentally happened. Right, exactly. And this is when everything gets really, really serious for Frank. And it's no longer laughing, and Beatty's not his, his buddy. He, Frank looks really, really worried. And Frank tries to squeeze by. Bunk's not letting him out. And Frank has to squeeze by. And that's when we really get these close-ups of Nick watching, watching it unfold and watching his, his uncle squeeze away. And Frank goes into the bathroom to wash his face and looks like he's having a full-blown panic attack. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's some guilt there, too, because, again, it's kind of implied that he's a little – religious and, and and he's not he has morals he has a moral compass so it just reminded him that there's a bunch of dead girls on his watch i feel like i feel like it's a combination of all those things you know and he knows that the union is already in a bad place with everything going on so i think that final scene hammers home that he's finding out all this information one by one because like you said compassion and finding out like they're dead and and now to this point this new news that it's a murder this is a lot for him to handle He's not, and we saw when he was bribing Clay Davis, he's not slick, he's not smooth, he's not a, crim, a smart criminal mastermind. Not at all. He's just a blue-collar guy who kind of does what he has to do to provide for everybody. Yeah. And that's how we go out. Close out on the on the bathroom wall, the painting there, and, and that's it. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool ending. And they, I, the thing about The Wire is it's never like a predictable ending. It's always you end with like one kind of somber note, if anything. So. So what do you think? Well, like I said, Daniels killed it this episode. My favorite Daniels episode yet. So um, I'm a fan of what he did, how he handled all his uh, political situations and building a new unit. And then Omar um, flexed a little muscle on Bubs. But otherwise, you know, if we're talking about who won this week, we have Avon and his crew. They definitely got a victory. They're going to get their sentence reduced. Their plan went in motion with uh, the cop. So, you know, they're definitely in the running for a great W this week. We got to keep into keep in mind that Stringer had to step on the, the coke, so on the weight. So that's kind of not good either. So that might cancel out the win with uh, Tillman. And they lost D'Angelo. True. And they lost D'Angelo as a soldier, as a loyal soldier. That's very true. But you know what they? But by getting Tillman, they—I mean, not that Weebay was ever in question. Weebay's always been down, but they've really solidified Weebay now by taking care of Tillman. Mm. So you know, but the ports with the with the biggest definite L of the episode, right? Ports. But I gotta tell you, at this point, it feels like Nick and Frank have completely separate goals. True. That while. Frank had an L at the end of this episode. Nick is sitting kind of high on his $8,000 score, $6,000 score. Yeah. For, yeah he's buying for, a house. Yeah, he's buying a house, so good for him. <laughs> so next episode, season two, episode five, is Undertow. All right. Well, thanks for watching. I'm Sean. It's my first watch. I'm Brad. It's my rewatch. The Wire. All right. See you next week. Later.